Oh, hi. Recently, we put a home gym in our house. I mean, really, it was just a spare room and we filled it up with a bunch of gym equipment. But I got to tell you, it's my favorite room in the whole house. Not because I'm in there working out all the time, but because when it comes to home gyms, you can't really build anything. I mean, you just go to the store and buy that stuff and stick it in there. It was the easiest room to do in the entire house. That was until this last week when my wife was in there and she said that she wanted a bench built for the gym. Not a bench that you like work out on, but like a bench that you could sit on. Really, she wanted something to go underneath the TV that's in the gym to hide all the cables and cords and TV components. So here I am building furniture for the home gym. And on top of that, she said she wanted it to look jimmy. Jimmy? How do you build a piece of furniture that looks jimmy? I built furniture for Bob and Sam and, and Alex once. Not Jim. So here it is, our home gym, and if you know my wife, you know anything in our house has to look, well, put together. So that's what this bench is all about, giving her a storage space under the TV that can hide all this electrical stuff and wireless router, and look, in her words, Jimmy. Now we have this old set of lockers next to where the bench is going to go, so my initial thought is try and make it somewhat locker-esque. I'm thinking kind of old school, like a piece of furniture you would see in a library or a locker room in the 1950s. So I quickly got on SketchUp and started throwing a design together. Now I know this doesn't look like much right now, but you know, the devil's in the detail and I'll make it look more Jimmy as we go along. Now when I think old school furniture, and not old school as in old school, but like old schoolhouse furniture, I think quarter sawn white oak. It just seems like that was the popular thing. So that's what I started with, some eight quarter quarter sawn white oak. Because pretty much all the lumber I use is rough sawn, the first thing I had to do was mill it up to get it nice and square and flat and easy to work with. Then I cut it up into bite sized chunks and I went over to my table saw and I started ripping it into one and a half inch by one and a half inch pieces. Because when I designed it in SketchUp, well, that's what I built the entire frame out of. So seemed like a good place to start. Whenever I'm trying to get lumber to a very specific dimension, I get it close on the table saw and then I usually bring it right to that dimension over on the planer or the drum sander. I just find this to be more accurate and I can get perfect squares that way. Once I had all my pieces dimensionalized, dim dimensionalized, dimensionally where I wanted them, I started laying out all of my components for said gym bench. This started by setting up a stop block on the miter saw and cutting a bunch of uniformed pieces to the right height. Now I want this to be a bench that you can actually sit on, which means I want to make it a standard chair height, which is between 19 and 20 inches. I started by making my end caps or my frame pieces. They're going to look something like this, only I'm going to actually put some joinery in there so that they stay together. To join this whole thing, I'm going new school, as opposed to the old school design, meaning I'm just going to use the domino joiner, because it's quick, it's easy, and it makes a strong joint. So I took a little setup block that was exactly four inches, and I used that to set my stretchers on the bottom, and then the top stretcher I just put flush with the top pieces. I marked out where my dominoes needed to go, grabbed the domino joiner, did a couple patented hip thrusts, and I had all my pieces mortised out, and I was ready to insert my dominoes. I mean, this is what you gotta love about the domino joiner. It really does make joinery incredibly quick. So in no time, I had the rough shape of my two end cap thingamawetsits. Now you might be saying, but I see three of them there. Well, that's because I also made one for the middle of the bench. And if you're wondering how in the world that's going to work, well, so am I at this point, but we'll deal with that later. For now, I got to figure out how to float a panel in the middle of these pieces. Thought about using the dado stack on the table saw, and then I opted for the router table. I just figured it would be a cleaner cut and I can have a stop dado and not have to run all the way through with that weird arc of the table saw blade. 
Anyways, I went over to the router table, I chalked up a quarter inch compression bit, and I started running my pieces through, carving out a nice quarter inch by quarter inch channel down the center of all of my pieces. Now the top and bottom stretchers, I was able to just blow right through the entire thing. But when it came to my legs, I had to stop before I got past the stretcher location on the bottom, or else you'd see that groove on the leg. Didn't want that to happen. So I just went until I hit the mortise for my dominoes and I knew that was the right place to stop. Pretty soon I had all of my parts and pieces hogged out with the groove and this should allow me to eventually insert a panel and make it look all pretty. Now lots of times when I'm building furniture for bathroom vanities that are gonna be painted, I'll just throw a piece of quarter inch plywood in for my panels. Sometimes I'll even do MDF if I'm painting it. But because I'm using quarter sawn white oak for this entire project, I knew that a store-bought piece of veneered white oak plywood just wouldn't match the true quarter sawn stock that I'm building the rest of the bench out of. But I did have this giant piece of quarter sawn white oak sitting in my lumber rack for, I don't know, years at this point. And I figured I might as well do the panels out of solid wood. Lots of people don't like using solid wood for panels because they're worried about wood movement. That's why plywood is such a popular thing. But if you do it right, wood movement isn't gonna be a problem and I'll show you how I do it to kinda alleviate that risk. So after planing down my quarter sawn piece to a quarter of an inch, yes, just sending a ton of material into my dust collection bin. I could've resawed it on the bandsaw, but I don't have time for that, nor do I have a tall enough bandsaw so planing it down it was and pretty soon I had my panels now the panels did run into the dominoes so I had to mark out where the dominoes were so that I could notch out the panel just a little bit to fit around those dominoes I mean if I would have done a true shaker style mortise and tenon I probably could have alleviated this but a little notch notch here and notch notch there never hurt anybody it looked something like this and now it should be able to slide in right next to those dominoes, something like this, right here. If you might just get your arm out of the way so that people can see. There you go, look at that. Beautiful quarter sawn panel inside a quarter sawn frame. Now the trick to doing solid wood panels is you have to make them truly floating, which means I am not going to glue these panels in place. They're just going to be held in that groove with no glue and this will allow them to move around. That being said, before I install the panels and glue up my frame, I have to pre-finish the panel. If you don't pre-finish the panel, it might look good when you first put finish on it, but as that wood moves, you're going to get a nice halo ring around the inside of the panel where you didn't get finish on initially and ain't nobody wants that kind of ring. It's not the kind of ring that Beyonce's begging for in all those music videos. It's an ugly, unfinished ring around your panel. So just pre-finish it and then you don't have to worry about it. Now, some people might insert space balls, which are these little rubber balls to secure the panel and keep it from wiggling and rocking. But I found as long as you get a nice tight friction fit, you're not gonna get any rocking or wiggling. So, I mean, I guess if you want to be lazy and make your cuts really loose and wonky, then yeah, use space balls so it doesn't rock around. Or you could just take the time to get a good fit and not worry about it. The choice is yours. At this point, I had three dividers all glued up with those pre-finished panels. Now to somehow connect them into a, a bench, a seat, a jimmy thing. Now I had previously taken measurements on the gym wall using my arms, stretched out as far as they could go. Now I'm six feet tall, so I know that my arm span is roughly six feet. So I decided to make my bench six feet long. It seemed appropriate. Don't laugh at me for not using a tape measure. Arms are just as good. So I cut some stretcher pieces to go between my two outside panels that would make the overall length of the bench six feet and I started marking out those stretchers for dominoes to be mortised on those two outside panels. Notice I'm not dealing with that center panel yet because I still haven't exactly decided how I'm gonna hook that all together. But again, we'll get to that in a little bit. I pulled out the domino joiner. I did a few more classic patented hip thrusts to mortise out all my mortises. And I did the same thing on my side panels. 
Unfortunately, this was up on the table, so the hip thrust didn't work. Believe me, I tried and, well, I'm gonna have to ice my knee later. It took a pretty bad spill. With all my mortises mortised, I was able to dry fit my bench together using my six foot span as a clamp. As you can see, I should have made it just a little skinnier because that is right at the very end of my reach. Maybe this is why I use a tape measure or just grab a clamp off the wall. You don't have to use your hands, but I got it together in the end. Now for this old chestnut. How do you get this panel to sit in the middle without using dominoes because it's the same width as your outside panels? And that's when it hit me. My Uncle Dan always says, when you can't zoop or zap, you better half lap. So that's what I decided to do. Just do some half lap joints in the middle of the stretchers and then do corresponding half lap joints on that middle panel and the whole thing will just right into place. So I marked out on my top and bottom stretchers where I needed to cut those half laps and the plan was just to disassemble the whole thing and take my stretchers over to the dado saw and carve them out. So with all of my half laps marked out, as you can see I like to scribble the amount of material I need to remove just so I don't make any mistakes. I did the same thing on my middle panel, on the top, and kind of middle-esque area down there. And with everything marked out, it was over to the dado saw to start cutting. Now the last thing you want in your life is a loosey-goosey half lap. So it's best to take your time and go slow. That's why I have a very skinny dado stack in the saw so I can really creep up on my dimension. You can always take more off, but you can't always put more on. That's not true. Actually, this is woodworking. You can always glue more on. It just takes longer and you kind of got to backtrack a little bit. So like I said, it's best to just go slow. Pretty soon I had the half laps cut on my middle divider piece and I carried it over just to kind of make sure everything was lined up correct. Then I disassembled my dry fit bench, took those stretcher pieces, made sure my marks were all nice and clear and it was back over to the dado saw to very slowly creep up on those pencil lines. A little bit here, a little bit there, and we were hopefully ready to reassemble this. Now this is where things are gonna start to get a little tricky because now instead of two panels, I'm dealing with three, one of them half lapped, two of them dominoed, so getting this together was gonna be a doozy. Not to mention I cut those half laps fairly tight so I can't just push them together. They're gonna require a little mallet work. So yeah, we'll see if I get through this whole thing without dropping something on the floor. I started out by doing an end panel, inserting that middle panel, getting those half laps locked in place on the lower stretchers, and then I moved to the upper stretchers. I just figured this would be the easiest order of operations because once I had those two pieces done, I could just kind of slide on that end cap. And I was very happy to see that it all worked and came together very nicely. We are well on our way to making a bench. Unfortunately, if you tried to sit on this bench at this point, I think your butt would get stuck in that giant hole in the top. So before I get too much farther, I decided to make a top for the bench. I had some other quarter sawn pieces laying around, so I milled them all up to make them look pretty, and then I glued them together to create my bench top. I didn't have one piece wide enough, so I had to do three pieces glued together, but that's fine. Just a light bead of glue in each seam. I didn't put any dominoes or biscuits in there because, well, you just don't need them. So once I got the entire thing in clamps, I hit it with a hammer to get my seams lined up because I didn't use any dominoes or biscuits so my seams weren't lined up. Anyways, while I waited for that to dry, I needed to add some dividers between my top and bottom stretchers on the front of the bench to create little bays or cubbies that will become our storage compartments as the bench build progresses. I don't know why I went all NPR there for a second. That's not how I talk. Anyways, I cut some pieces of wood and I shoved them in the voids. Ta-da! 
Now that I had those where they needed to go, I pulled them out and once again back to that good old hip thrusterooski to mortise out some holes and then I had to deassemble the entire bench again so I could add mortises to those stretchers. Then I could insert those dividers and very carefully try and wiggle this whole contraption back into place. Again. I wonder how many times on average I assemble and disassemble a single piece of furniture while I'm making it. I mean, it's gotta be quite a lot. You take it apart, you put it together. You put it together, you take it apart. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, this whole furniture making thing is a lot of work. If only there was some big, like, store you could go to that just had furniture there already made. That would be nice. That's a million dollar idea right there. Before I could find another excuse to take this entire thing apart and put it back together, I decided I better just glue the whole thing together so I wouldn't have the option to take it back apart. So very carefully, domino by domino, I worked my way down the line, gluing all the dominoes in place and trying not to put anything back together in the wrong order. I'm 85% sure I got it together correctly. The hardest part was this internal divider because I basically had to get that seated first and then build the rest on the outside. So it was kind of like this giant teeter-totter while I was doing the glue up until I got one end cap on. But it all came together mostly stress-free. I mean, it is nice to be beating something with a hammer the entire time because any stress you get immediately just floats away with every pound of the mallet. I learned from my previous mistake of trying to use my arms as clamps and I pulled some actual clamps off the wall to hold everything secure until the glue dried. While I waited for the glue to dry, I decided to get to work on my doors or drawer faces. Still not exactly sure what they're gonna be, but I decided to start working on them nonetheless. I measured my openings and realized I had just enough of this giant quarter sawn piece of white oak left over that I could use that to do continuous grain match across the entire front and make all my door faces out of single pieces of oak. Which is awesome, because it means a lot less milling and a lot less gluing things up. So I set up a stop block over on my miter saw to get my drawer faces the exact right dimension and very carefully I started working my way down the line, making sure to keep track of all of my pieces so they stayed in the right order. The worst is when you mix them up and then you're trying to guess where the grain goes back together, especially with quarter sawn because the grain is so similar, sometimes it gets confusing. That's why before I did anything else, I put some pieces of tape on each seam and I marked them so there would be no confusion. Now I already mentioned that I kind of wanted to make this look like an old set of lockers. So I wanted to do some sort of grate or vent pattern on the front of each drawer face. I experimented around with a few different pattern options that I did over on the Shaper Origin and my wife finally picked out this pattern, which meant that is what we're doing. No questions, no arguments, you just do it. So I set up a nice shaper station in the corner with the shaper plate thingamawatsit and I created the whole pattern that my wife desired and I started drilling it into each and every drawer face. It actually looks pretty cool and definitely gives that old school locker vibe that I was looking for. Ah, nice. Now this might have been one of the few times I wished I had a CNC because that was one panel done, three to go, and although the Shaper Origin makes it much, much easier to cut these out, it still takes a long time to drill all of those holes. About halfway through, I realized my glue was dry, so I took off all my clamps so that I could see the piece a little bit better, and I just kept working my way along until pretty soon all of the doors were drilled. At least, that's what I thought. And then, like I always do, I decided to make things way more complicated than they needed to be. I had already ordered these cool little stainless steel locker plates that I thought would be a nice addition. But what's better than a locker plate just screwed on the front of a drawer face? A locker plate inset 
on the front of the drawer face. So I took each drawer face back off, went over to the shaper, and I carved out a nice little recess that could hold each and every locker plate. Because I just can't help myself but making things ridiculously detailed when they don't need to be. But I will admit, it does make it look pretty cool. And I even made them a little bit big, so there was a nice little recess border around each plate. The next big question was what to do for drawer pulls or cabinet pulls or hardware of any kind on these faces. I really wanted to stay with the locker vibe, so after looking at a lot of pictures of lockers, this is what I came up with. I took each face back over to the shaper and I hogged out this set of recesses in the top of each face. You have a lip around the outside and then a deeper recess in the middle. No, that's not going to be the drawer pull, just wait till I'm done. After I recessed that shape out on every single panel, so they looked something like this, I milled down some more quarter sawn oak to about a quarter of an inch thick. Took that back over to the shaper and using that same shape I just cut out, but this time cutting on the outside of the cut instead of the inside, I cut out these little ring-shaped pieces. Once I pry this up, you'll see what I'm talking about. They looked something like this. Now, if I did this correctly, these should perfectly fit into that recessed lip on the outside, creating a very nice wooden locker-inspired integrated drawer slash cabinet door pull. I haven't decided which one I'm doing yet, so stay tuned for that. But as you can see, once I got them all done, they look pretty nice. All I'll have to do is eventually glue that little ring in place and, ah, wooden lockers. By this time, my bench top had been in clamps long enough, so I unclamped it and sent it through the planer to knock down all my glue seams. It's always really enjoyable when you can send an entire panel through your planer and you don't have to sand the whole thing. Then it was over to my miter saw to cut it to the correct length, and I set it on top of the bench to get a first look. Oh. Now you could sit on it without falling through that giant hole in the top. I mean, we practically have a bench. And there's no bottom on the inside of the bench or back on it, but we're going to take care of that right now. I flipped the bench over and I cut some three quarter inch strips of white oak that I'm going to glue around the entire interior of this bottom hole to create a lip on the inside that I can set a panel on top of. If that doesn't make any sense at all, I'm basically just clamping and gluing a bunch of pieces of wood on to create a shelf to set my bottom piece on. And if that doesn't make any sense at all, well, just watch the video. I'll show you what I'm talking about eventually. While I waited for the glue to dry on those pieces, I poured myself a nice glass of bourbon and unfortunately, it was time to sand down all of my drawer faces and get them ready for finish. Which also meant that I needed to glue this little integrated pull ring thing in place. But before I glued it in place, I wanted to pre-finish that internal cavity. Because in a move that is very unlike me, I actually thought ahead and realized I would have a doozy of a time getting finish in there after that ring was glued in place. So using a very minimal amount of glue, because I really didn't want to deal with squeeze out, I very carefully inserted those pieces into the hole, gave them a little tap 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 a with a mallet and a scrap piece of wood, and they were installed. About a half an hour and a few glasses of whiskey later, all my drawer faces were sanded, my poles were installed, and my internal little holes were oiled up. The internal holes on the drawer faces, not my internal holes. A half an hour is long enough to take clamps off of something, right? Sure, why not? While I had the bench flipped over, I decided to add a little chamfer to the bottom of each one of the feet. This is always a nice choice stylistically, but it really helps prevent any chip out on the bottom of those feet as you drag the bench back and forth across your floors. Just something to think about when you're building a bench, or a table, or a chair, bar stool, really any piece of wood that comes in contact with the floor, it's always a good idea. 
Next, I had to figure out how to install the back panel so that the bench wasn't backless. It's not that fancy, all right? This is like a casual bench. It's not a backless sort of thing. My solution was to carve out a rabbit around both back panel sections with the router bit. And then I'm just gonna cut a piece of quarter inch veneered oak plywood and set it in there. So after taking all my measurements, I cut a piece of oak veneered plywood and I set it in there. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that because as you can see, the router leaves these round corners. Now, you could cut these to a perfect 90 with a chisel, do it all by hand, but sometimes you mess up, doesn't look super clean, and I think it's a lot easier just to round over your panel to match the already perfectly rounded rabbit, if you ask me. So I found the right radius with a little router template that I had in my drawer, traced it on there, went over to the oscillating belt sander, and just kind of sanded it to my line until it fit. And as you can see, you can get a pretty nice tight fit just by sanding those corners down. And then it kind of looks cool, all rounded and retro on the back of a bench that nobody's ever going to see because it's up against a wall, but... Anyways, there's how I did the back panels. Now, I would normally use a piece of three quarter inch or half inch ply for my bottoms, but I didn't want to buy a full sheet of oak veneered plywood in three quarter inch and quarter inch. So I just used my quarter inch and hid a piece of half inch birch underneath it. No one's gonna know. I mean, Literally every single person who watches this video is now going to know, but other than that, if someone just comes in my house, they're not going to know. Anyways, next I needed to add a little tab on the top of each one of my openings so that the drawer face slash cabinet door, I haven't decided which one yet, will have something to land on and stay, you know, perfectly inset, not go too far inset if you know what I mean. So a couple drops of tight bond, one drop of super glue, and I just squeezed it on there and used my old finger clamps until it dried. The next morning I came out to the shop and I was finally ready to get some finish on this thing. Which means that for the 28th time I had to deassemble the entire thing. Is it deassemble or disassemble? I'm realizing now it's disassemble. Have I been saying deassemble this whole time like an idiot? I had to disassemble the entire thing. And this might also be a good time to come clean and admit that when I say I am going to put finish on this, what I really mean is I'm gonna make Craig put finish on this. I mean, look at all those holes. You think I want to meticulously get finish in each and every one of those holes? I don't think so. This is exactly why you have employees. To do all the stuff that you're too lazy to do yourself. So, enjoy Craig. While Craig was busy finishing, I mean literally he was in the middle of finishing this while I came over and started drilling holes in it, I decided to add some nice stainless steel feet on the bottom of each one of my wooden feet. It's kind of like clip-on nails for your hand. I mean, you already have a hand, but you want something else on it. So you're like, what else could I put on this hand that already does its job? Oh, I know, something pretty and shiny. So I put on those stainless steel feet. That's where my head was at when I was doing it. And for all you haters that are like, you made Craig do everything, I did put finish on the top myself, so I helped a little bit. Now, if you ever spend countless hours putting together a nice quarter sawn oak top and sanding it and then putting finish on it, the very next thing you should do is drill a bunch of holes in it, just on a whim, because you all of a sudden had an idea, didn't think through it at all, and just went for it. Because that's exactly what I did in this case. I had these stainless steel carriage bolts laying around the shop and I thought maybe it would be a nice accent if I added some of those on the bench top. Now before you call me crazy, just hear me out. 
If you look at any sort of gym furniture, bleachers, locker room benches, I mean, they got these carriage bolts on there. And I got the stainless steel feet down below, so why not put a little stainless steel up top to match? And if that's not enough, I also got those stainless steel locker plates that are going to go on each drawer face slash door. Haven't decided yet. So the stainless steel theme kind of continues throughout. With everything finished, I dropped in my secret birch panels and I tacked them in place. This actually kind of worked out good because now I can tack the birch in place and I can just glue the quarter inch panel on top and cover all those nail holes. So after getting the birch tacked in place just with some 16 gauge brad nails, I smeared on a little wood glue here or there. Nothing too crazy. You don't need a lot of holding power. And I inserted my now pre-finished oak veneered quarter inch panel. And with that, I could really start to see this thing take shape. I had a nice friction fit on my quarter inch panels, so I really didn't need anything to hold them down while I waited for that glue to dry. I just pounded them in with my fist and left them. Now to the drawer face slash doors. I decided why not do sort of a hybrid thing. It's not a drawer, but it looks like one, but I don't want it to swing like a traditional cabinet door. So why not have it fold straight forward? I mean, it is gonna have electrical components in it. There might be a time that you wanna just leave the door open or access it easily. So I got on Amazon, I found these little hinges that just attach to the bottom and they're spring loaded. So they hold the door shut and in place, which is kind of nice. So I use some playing cards to wedge my door in its appropriate, you know, positioning. And then I screwed those hinges in from the back which was really nice that I hadn't installed those panels on the back yet. And they just fold forward. I actually think it's kind of cool. So I just slowly worked my way down the line. I had the foreman come out just to test the action on them, make sure they were up to his liking, which they were. And before long, I had all four doors I'm going with doors installed and it was time to secure the top Now to hook the top on I'm just going to use these Z fasteners I didn't show it but I pre-drilled some mortises with the domino joiner that those Z fasteners can slide into and hook the top on then I just had to pop my panels in the back of the bench and hold on to your seats I just nailed them in place with the nail gun I know you're cringing right now you're like what you're using a nail gun after you spend all this time, but just track with me for a second. If you look at any antique piece of furniture, the back panel is always just nailed on there. I mean, sure, they used fancy like antique nails and a hammer, but nails nonetheless. So don't get your britches in a bunch for me using a pneumatic nail gun when it's pretty much the same thing everybody else does. So take that to your comment section. I have to admit, when my wife first asked me to build a piece of furniture for our home gym, I thought it was kind of silly. But once I got started, I actually had a lot of fun. It was a super interesting challenge to try and create a piece of furniture that looked somewhat gym-esque, locker-esque, old school, and still function for what we needed it to function for, and would look good in the space. And I'm kind of sad that it's going to go into a room in the house that I never go into. I'm just kidding. I go in there sometimes to watch TV when my wife's watching Magnolia Network on the other one. I just need to get away. And sometimes I'll even I'll pick up weights and I'll just clank them together to make her think I'm in there working out. I'll turn the treadmill on and just let it run. But I'm just sitting in the corner drooling eating a bag of Doritos. Why have a six pack when you can have the whole kick? Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. A huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring the video. Now let me talk just for a second about Squarespace. Now when it came to finding a good platform to design a website on, I had a couple requirements. Number one, it had to be simple to use because I'm not very smart when it comes to computers. Number two, it needed to have a very good app 
I pretty much do everything on my iPhone. So I wanted to be able to operate and check on my website directly from my phone as well. Their app is perfectly integrated with their websites so you can check everything right from your phone. Like, I just saw that I got an order. So I can get on the Squarespace app, I can see how much inventory I have left. When I need new products, I can use my phone to take pictures of those products and upload those pictures directly to the website, which means I can add new products to the website in a matter of minutes. One of my favorite features of the Squarespace app is the analytics button, because this is fun to check and not only see what products I'm selling, but see how much products I've sold that month, see where those sales are coming from. They have this cool little map and I can look and see everywhere in the world that we've sold stuff. There are also times that I sell products directly to people in person. And the nice thing with the Squarespace app is that I can hook the Square card reader to my phone and it connects with the Squarespace app so that when I sell things in person, it automatically updates the quantity of my items on the Squarespace app so I don't have to do it manually. So if you would like to try Squarespace for yourself, you should go to squarespace.com slash bourbonmothwoodworking and you get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain when you use the coupon code bourbonmothwoodworking. I mean, you probably could have guessed that. Or you can just click the link in the video description and remember that coupon code is, well, it's bourbonmothwoodworking.